Thank you, uh, Jose, and I'm delighted to be in a room with uh, many of my very favorite people. Some of you I don't even know, but you're already my favorite people. <laughs> and you are my favorite people because of the work that you do on behalf of Canadians. This has been, for me, uh, an enriched experience beyond which I cannot uh, give adequate explanation. It began for me, as some of you know, with the death of my own mother and the fact that I had some serious concerns about her care at the end. That led me to visit the St. Boniface Hospital Palliative Care Unit. And it sounds like a, a funny thing to end up doing, but I had a bunch of women liberals who had reached the stage that they couldn't campaign any longer. They were getting old, and they, but they still wanted to contribute to their community. So I went out and I bought a whole bunch of wool and set them to making Afghans. And we delivered uh, an Afghan to every bed at the St. Boniface Palliative Care Unit uh, from the Liberal women in, in the province of Manitoba. That's how it started, really, in terms of, of my passion and concern. I was appointed to the Senate in September of 1994, and I received a phone call from the then deputy government leader in the Senate, uh, Gil Mogat, also a Manitoban, and he said, Sharon, do you have any ish interest in the issue of euthanasia and assisted suicide? And I said, well, I have concerns. Uh, I have, I suppose, a knowledge based on the same kind of knowledge that every other Canadian has about Sue Rodriguez, who was a case at the time, and Robert Latimer, who was a case at the time. And he said, well, the Senate has decided to do this study, and one of the members has resigned. Would you be willing to replace him on this committee? So I agreed, because it happened to be the Western minister, a Western member who wasn't there. So I agreed to go on the committee. So interestingly enough, I found myself sitting at a committee hearing on euthanasia and assisted suicide before I had actually been sworn in to the Senate because the committee was coming to Winnipeg that week. And that's how I met Harvey Chachanoff. So life kind of went from there. Uh, we did that first study and tabled it in 95. And as you perhaps are well aware, there was no unanimity on the issue of euthanasia and assisted suicide. But what we had clearly identified was a number of issues about the care of the dying for which there was complete unanimity. But governments, of course, can take reports and studies. Dr. Gallagher perhaps knows this better than anybody. Uh, and they can seek to do something about them or they can seek to ignore them. In this case, because the study was on euthanasia and assisted suicide and because we didn't have any firm conclusions, it was very easy to take the study and put it on a shelf and just simply ignore it. I was quite determined that wasn't going to happen. And so just about this time in 1999, I asked the Senate of Canada if I could do a further study. Only on the unanimous recommendations of the 95 report, and that is what we tabled in June of 2000, and that was the end-of-life care, uh, or quality end-of-life care, the right of every Canadian. We got a lot of publicity on that report. My favorite was a quote from a doctor whom I do not know, who said, I think I've died and gone to heaven. <laughs> uh, because obviously the recommendations that we had made were recommendations that he could clearly uh, support. But that's when the, the really hard work began. The writing of the report was, was easy. It was what did we do with the report once it was in the public venue in June of the year 2000. But then I can only say I think the Canadian stars were all in the right alignment. Because I committed myself to the hospice Canadian Hospice and Palliative Care Association for the next two years and said, well, as a senator, I have 24 tra 64 travel points a year. I think your biggest problem is that people don't know what it is you do. 
People don't understand what palliative care is all about. And that certainly came out of a survey that Angus Reid had done, which, in which said that 97% of Canadians wanted it, but only 25% of Canadians could tell me what it was. So it sounded awfully good, and it was a good thing to have, but they didn't know. So I felt the community had a serious communications problem. Well, as Harvey said so clearly in his own quote, which has become quite famous, the dying can't speak for themselves. They're too busy dying. And their families can't speak for them, and I'm paraphrasing, obviously, because they're grieving, or they're just hoping as best they can. The doctors and the nurses and the pharmacists and the social workers and the x-ray technicians and everyone else engaged in this process, quite frankly, is too busy providing the care. So who is going to speak? Well, it was kind of a, you know, you, you, and you, only the you just pointed to me. So I got to be the spokesperson. And then we all held a conference in Toronto, bringing caregivers together in a whole wide variety of areas. And I remember Janet Dumbrack, who was at that point the executive uh, director of uh, Canadian Hospice and Palliative Care Association. We went off for a coffee, and she said, what's this I hear about the fact that you may be government leader in the Senate? And I said, oh, you know, it's talk, it's chatter, it's, you know, who knows. But I said, wouldn't it be wonderful if I did, because then I could ask the prime minister to be the minister with special responsibility for palliative care. Well, we had a good giggle about it. I mean, the, the, the chances of this happening were just so, you know, so we had a good laugh and we, you know, wished each other a happy Christmas because it was early in December and off we went. Well, on the 9th of January, I was the government leader in the Senate. And I immediately went to see the Prime Minister and said, by the way, I'd like to be the Minister with Special Responsibility for Palliative Care. Well, I must admit, it was a somewhat bemused prime minister who looked at me as if to say, you know, ministers don't usually come to me and ask me for additional responsibilities. <laughs> Why do you want to do this? And so I told him. And he said, well, obviously, since you were carving off a bit of the health minister's portfolio here, it will have to be acceptable to the Minister of Health, who was the Honorable Alan Rock at that time. And Alan, of course, agreed that that's uh, what we should do. And I think the fascinating thing of this whole exercise is that the Minister with Special Responsibility for Palliative Care has never had one cent to spend. There is no budget line for the Minister with Special Responsibility for Palliative Care. It actually turned out to be an enormous advantage because I could then get everybody to give me money. And none of them could say, well, why don't you spend it from your own budget? Because I would say, I don't have a budget. <laughs> the first time I raised the issue, and I know some of you have heard this story, but I think it's, it's a classic. The first day I go to cabinet to kind of present a memorandum of understanding to, to the cabinet so that they can kind of buy in on what this new minister is going to do. You're sitting around an oval table. The cabinet room is, is a rectangular room, but the table is oval. And everybody's got their briefing books, which are stacked up about this high. And they're all, of course, waiting for their agenda item, and they're studying their notes, and they're doing their thing. I decided I wasn't going to get very far on this one. So I waited until I, my name had been called, and I waited a few more seconds because I believe in the poignant pause. And I said, you're all going to die. At which point, you know, 40 heads came up <laughs> off of the table. And I said, now we're going to talk about how you want to do it. Well, you can imagine there are uh, a number of names for me around the cabinet table, one of which is <laughs> Madam Death. Um, but it's gone into the annals, I have to tell you, of, of the bureaucrats who, who think that if you really want to get cabinet attention, just tell them they're all going to die. Um, and, that, and that will do it. What we had to do, however, very quickly, because 
I recognized that I had a very short time frame. You'll remember that the Prime Minister had just come off the 2000 election at this point, and it was clear that he was not going to run another time. It was equally clear that my chances of being government leader in the Senate under a new Prime Minister were probably zero, and that will happen next Friday when someone else is made the government leader in the Senate. So I thought that I would have a window of opportunity of maybe three years. And of course, that's exactly what it has turned out to be, it was a window of opportunity for three years. There were so many things we needed to do that the first exercise became a priority setting exercise. What did we think we could realistically accomplish in those three years that would push the agenda forward? And in discussions with staff and in discussions with people in the field, it seemed to me that there were three distinct areas that we had to make significant progress on. One was the issue of a caregiver protection package to allow family members to spend time, quality time, with gravely ill and dying family members. And that, you know, will go into effect on January of this coming year. And the program has been designed to be as flexible as possible. The six weeks, for example, do not have to be taken in a row. The six weeks do not have to be taken by the same family member. Up to six different family members could take one week each. Now, I suspect that's not how it's going to work in most cases, but I do suspect it's going to work 3-3 three, three, or 4-2, even perhaps 5-1 in some circumstances. And I think that, as we know, there will be crises that they may take three weeks and there's some certain stabilization and then maybe several months before another couple of weeks will have to be used. So they've done well in terms of designing how this program will work for Canadians. Is six weeks enough? No, it's not, but it's a start. And what we had to do was to get a concept of the program in the law. If you will remember, those of you who had babies at the time, I had babies, if there are any of you in this room, and I'm so much older than all the rest of you, we didn't have any maternity benefit. And then it got to be 13 weeks, and then it got to be 26 weeks, and now it's 52 weeks. So I don't think that the six-week program is a carved in stone figure. I think as we identify greater need, it can in fact be a program that can grow and be enlarged upon. So that was one issue. The second issue was research. Because as we learned so clearly in our, both of our studies, that there was still so much more that needed to be learned about the care of those dying in our communities. Everything from pain management to proper nutrition to all of the interdisciplinary tasks that needed to go hand in hand. And if we couldn't develop good research, then the chances of us getting funding for those initiatives was going to be significantly diminished. Well, again, the stars were obviously in their horizon and in the right lineup because I asked to meet with the scientific directors of the Canadian Institutes for Health Research, which Dr. Fields was making reference to. And so I went into a breakfast meeting in the morning in a September, I guess, of 2002, and we started talking about what I was doing as the minister with special responsibility for palliative care and the need for research. And I don't know whether it was the bagels they ate that morning, <laughs> but whatever it was, 
all of a sudden, there was almost an electricity in the room. I mean, the cancer people were clearly on side and had been for a long time. But all of a sudden, the cardiologist scientific director was saying, well, you know, this is something we should be involved in. And the aging scientific director was saying, this is something we should be involved in. And the one dealing with nutrition was saying, well, yeah, but you're talking about things that are in my purview. And by the end of the day, we had six of them actually saying, we need to do something in terms of research in the field of palliative care. So we could identify about $200,000 a year in monies that were open and eligible to those working in palliative medicine in terms of research dollars. Well, 2004, there will be $12 million available for research in palliative care over a five-year period, but $12 million, which makes it about $2.5 million a year. So there's been, again, an incredible response to the need for research. The final piece that I felt we had to do something about, and this is the one that Jose made reference to a few minutes ago, was physician education. Whether we like it or we don't, physicians remain the gatekeepers of the healthcare system. If physicians were not knowledgeable, were not accepting and were not open about palliative care, then I was of the view that all the good work of nurses, pharmacists, social workers, and everyone else was not going to be able to reach its true fruition. Do I want all of them educated? Absolutely. But where did we have to start? And for me, it was the physician education piece. And this is where pallium is such a critical and important part. The fact that pallium has received this $4.3 million under the national envelope of the Primary Health Care Transition Fund means that they can focus on the continuing education of all of those presently in the field. This other piece of the puzzle that I was able to achieve $1.25 million for was to get it going in the medical school so that we had not just physicians already in practice through the good work of Pallium and through, quite frankly, the Ian Anderson Foundation and other initiatives proceeding at the same time, we would also have this other uh, compulsory training of all undergraduate physicians. When I was in Portugal two weeks ago, one of the questions I got asked by a former politician who stood in his place and said to me, well, I don't understand why you want to make this compulsory in Canada. And I said, well, it's really very simple. When physicians are offered an optional course in Canada in palliative medicine, only 20% of them choose to take it. So if I'm going to educate all physicians in palliative care, then it has to be compulsory. But I said, I want you to look at it from a slightly different angle. I said, we would not consider educating a medical school student and not training them how to deliver a baby. And yet only 50% of their potential patients are ever going to do that. But 100% of them are going to die. He didn't ask any more questions at this particular point in time. So it's been exciting. It really has been an incredible experience for me because I got to meet some very, very special people from coast to coast to coast. 
I have been, I, I couldn't tell you how many palliative care units I have been in, how many hospices I've been in, how many hospitals I've been in across this country, or how many dying Canadians I have actually spoken with. My staff could probably tell you how many speeches I've given. Um, since they had to write most of them, they, they probably have it down to a number. But what happened with this file was something very, very unique. Because not only do I not have any money to spend on this, I didn't have any staff on this. Now, I have 22 staff as government leader in the Senate, but not one designated for palliative care. So I went to the staff and said, this is what I want to do. And all 22 said, we'll do it with you. Every single one of them. Some of them obviously far more engaged than, than others, but not one refused. And in fact, it was better than a refusal. All of them did it with great enthusiasm. When I would go to a conference one year and find that there were maybe 200 people and go back two or three years later, between 95 and now, and find out there were 600, 800 people, I think we have to realize that this is an issue which is of passionate concern to Canadians. They want quality end of life care for their fellow citizens, and in particular, for those that they love. There has been a seed change here. But none of it would have happened without you. I'm still the one that gives the speeches. I'm still the one that has the ministerial designation. But I don't deliver the service you do. And that's why it has been such an incredible experience for me. Because I've met you. I've learned how much you care, how much you give of yourself to your fellow Canadians. My father was a politician, and I was educated that politics was a service. And I sincerely believe that. Earlier this week, I met with 15 pages in the Senate. They're all bright-eyed and bushy-tailed. They're all about 18 or 19 or 20 years old. They're almost all studying political science, either at the University of Ottawa or, the, or Carleton University. And they asked me, what is it like to be a senator? Well, it's a very unique opportunity. You're asked by the Prime Minister to serve for a number of years. In my case, it was actually 23 because I was appointed at age 52. You're given a budget, given a staffing, you're given an office, and you're given the luxury of time. You're given the opportunity to take the time to become a champion for an issue or two or three or four, whatever it is that you choose to take on. There's lots of legitimate criticism of the Senate. But what a lot of people don't know is that I'm not alone in taking on a cause. There are many senators who do exactly the same thing. And they spend their time and their energies devoted to issues which are of concern to the Canadian people. And it may be that the issue is like Senator Landon Pearson, which is the war-affected child.
And she gives hours and hours and hours of dedicated time to this particular issue. And many of you in this room probably have never heard of her. But she has brought about significant change because of the stand that she has taken in this area. And there are other senators taking other issues. So I won't be in Cabinet next Friday, and I will no longer be the Minister with Special Responsibility for Palliative Care. But let me assure you that I will continue to serve my fellow Canadians. I will continue to be an advocate on behalf of hospice palliative care. I will also continue to be an advocate on other issues that are of concern to me. Quite frankly, I'm quite appalled that the criminal code still allows the corporal punishment of children in this country. And that is a cause I have taken up before and I will take up again. But don't ever think that I will ignore you. You have become part of my soul, part of my spirit, and I thank you for all that you're doing. Thank you very much.